do this talk because a few weeks ago I was watching an episode of First Dates and there was a guy on there and he was a historian and his date asked him, oh, do you like Game of Thrones? And he said, um, no, I don't like it because it's not historically accurate. <laughs> and I thought, what a twat. And then I realised this is sort of what this talk is. So I'm going to try and not get to a Neil deGrasse Tyson level of pedantic, but bear with me. Um, so my name's Lydia and I'm a biologist and I'm bored of aliens in video games. Um, scientists have been talking about the concept of extraterrestrials for centuries, but it wasn't until the space race that they really entered the mainstream. Aliens allowed us to tell new stories, to explore our own humanity and our values as a species. At some point, however, the deep existential question, are we alone in the universe, became woven into eccentric fringe fantasy theories. Um, the extraterrestrials from the Roswell UFO conspiracy canonized the supernatural, grey humanoid alien image in pop culture, and unfortunately our depictions of aliens haven't matured much since. Space magic, telepathy, and creepy humanoids can make for fun storytelling, but for a biologist it can be quite distracting. The real science has been left behind. Uh, so what do I mean by real alien science, because that still sounds quite eccentric. It's called astrobiology, and it's mainstream scientific thought now. There are billions of planets in our galaxy alone. Um, by mere probability, another one must be suitable for life. Uh, the best place to look for complex life is on a planet like our own. It sounds really unimaginative at first to limit our search like this, but chemists have been doing some equations, and it turns out that we're pretty perfect. The chemicals we're made up are not only the most abundant in the universe, but they're also the best at what they do. Biochemists have tried imagining life using substitute elements. They've done this in the lab by uh, taking microbes, and so phosphorus is a really common element in our bodies. It's essential for DNA. And so they decided to take some bacteria, put it in a Petri dish, and give it arsenic instead, because arsenic is really similar chemically to phosphorus. Well, it turns out they didn't really like that, and they died. And <laughs> so as fun as sort of huge rock monsters made out of silicon rather than carbon, or creatures that drink ammonia rather than water sound, uh, chemically it's quite improbable. Um, Basing aliens on real biology that obey the laws of physics doesn't have to be boring. These are all animals that have existed on our own planet. They're not great humanoids, they don't have supernatural powers, nor do they want to eat us. Well, maybe that guy does. Um, but they're weird and wonderful and they look alien as hell. And it's fair to assume that life evolving on Earth-like planets could produce equally amazing diversity within a similar environment. So why don't we see these designs in visual media? Why do artists turn to space magic or humanoids with bug faces? There are a number of reasons, but I think it comes to, down to three main points. Um, the first being anthropocentrism. I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what evolution is. Um, bipedalism and big brains are just the byproduct of our own evolution and our own history on Earth. They're not some evolutionary end goal, and there's absolutely no reason why an intelligent life form would look like us. Um, the second is cinematography. Visual designs can be used as storytelling shorthands. Humans are drawn to faces like our own. E.T. looking like a shriveled human baby, rather than a xenomorph, quickly conveys information visually that this is a creature we can empathize with and unlike the xenomorph, which is terrifying. And of course money. TV and film once had costume departments. Star Trek worked around this by creating lore, explaining the abundance of humanoids. Um, but what about video games? I don't think it's as cut and dry as the budget limit. The movements that aliens need to perform are dictated by the stories being told. What role is the alien playing in the narrative? 
I think this comes back to an older debate about diversity of game genres. Often aliens are the antagonists in warfare, and this means restrictions in design. Your human character can't loot and use a gun from a creature that doesn't have hands. It can't hijack alien technology in a hacking minigame if the creature doesn't use written or verbal communication. Alien architecture, furniture, spaceships and tools all have to be accessible for the human character to use. This is why boring alien designs in games are less to do with just an unimaginative art department and more intrinsically linked to the whole game itself. I want to talk about two games that do interesting things with their aliens. Um, in Mass Effect, you play a human called Commander Shepard. You're a space marine trying to find humanity's place in a galactic community of intelligent aliens. Here's a quote from Derek Watts explaining the boundaries the art department had to work within when designing the aliens. Um, the developers openly admit that budget restrictions restrained their creative design. To compensate, Bioware developed a rich story and clever visual shorthands. But for me, what's fascinating is that simultaneously, they create some of the most interesting, but also outright terrible aliens I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> the Asaris are problematic, to say the least. Uh, Hypersexualized blue monogender aliens that just so happen to look like very attractive human women. They can mind meld, they're good at space magic, they live for up to a thousand years and bizarrely require other species to reproduce. The Asaris are the nadir of terrible alien designs. They're what I like to call fantasy space bollocks. They make absolutely no sense from a biological standpoint or even within Mass Effect's own law. Uh, Mostly because the Osiris first made contact with the other aliens in Mass Effect about 2,000 years ago, and that's like a few generations in their species. And already they're deciding the only way to have babies is to shag other people. Uh, <laughs> the Osiris are remnants of a less progressive era of Bioware. Female aliens regularly fall victim to the same anthropocentric sexualization that we often see in fantasy. Males are allowed to be hideous, but some artists really struggle with the concept of ugly females and how to present them without softening or sexualization. This is particularly problematic when designing intelligent aliens because obviously our beauty standards would mean absolutely nothing to another species. <laughs> Here's a quote from Derek Watts again <laughs> regarding the female designs of the other races in Mass Effect. Um, it's a real gem. Why, as an artist, you would admit to having a bad imag imagination, I don't know. The point is, is that the Asaris were not just blue humans. Uh, because of budget restrictions, they were a boring artistic choice and Bioware proved this themselves by creating two very special species within the same game, adhering to the same boundaries. And I'm pleased to announce that they figured out how to draw a female Turian. Uh, the Turians are one of my favorite alien species from anything. They're former imperialists, and superficial, superficially this is reflected in quite a vicious design. They're scary, ugly, and they look they'd look at home at, in sci-fi horror. But the Turians are from a harsh planet with high levels of radiation. There's an evolutionary purpose for their hard metallic bodies. They even, they even have blue blood. There are creatures on Earth that have blue blood, and some studies have indicated that it can exhibit tumor-suppressing qualities. This would be an excellent protective adaptation for Turians that live with such high exposure to radiation. My favorite detail are the sharp lines of the male fringe, which initially look intimidating, but are later revealed to just be for attracting a partner. As a visual shorthand, these designs convey a hostile, dangerous species. But the Turians aren't this. They're as complex as human beings. Your Turian par party member, Garrus, is the most beloved character in the franchise. I love Turian biology, but I also love that ally races were allowed to be scary and ugly. In reality, an alien's appearance would depend on their own evolution and would have little to do with their culture and how we should, 
how we should interpret them. And the Turians are a great example of this. Another great species are the Salarians. Their bioware's take on the classic greys. They have these large craniums and big eyes that we associate with mystery and superior intellect. They're a classic alien design, but with a twist, grounded in reality. They're actually just space frogs. They're from a high oxygen jungle planet with amphibious life cycles. The Salarians don't have the supernatural powers of the greys. They're short-lived, fallible, intelligent, but often morally unsophisticated. If a Salarian were to abduct and probe you, there'd be a serious lawsuit coming their way. Uh, Mass Effect also includes a variety of shapes and quirks for their NPC aliens. It's little details like these that flesh the universe out. The aliens are given agency with individual personalities and can develop a close relationship with you. They're civilized in a manner that you would expect from advanced spacefaring species and their stories are just as important as humanities. Um, controversies aside, No Man's Sky also does some interesting things. You're not a fighter, you're an explorer. You can visit thousands of different life-bearing planets, and because they're procedurally generated, you can see some really fascinating looking creatures. These aliens exhibit predator-prey relationships and qualities like exotic genders. The concept of alien life forms existing outside our traditional human ideas of binary sex and gender is something rarely explored and a detail I appreciated. Unfortunately, a real missed opportunity with No Man's Sky are the sentient aliens. You only encounter three main races and they're woefully cliched. The traders, the warriors and the scientists. Bizarrely for a game set in another galaxy, they're all bipedal humanoids. Um, there's no reason for them to look like this because they don't do anything. You don't see them walk. They don't need human animations. Hello Games could have gone to town with these guys. There's no reason an eight-legged, tentacled, furry slug thing couldn't have been sitting behind those kiosks to sell me blueprints. I must admit, this disappointed me more than the other games' complaints. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> going forward um, video games hold such unique potential they can tell interactive stories that few other mediums can aliens are most commonly used as the antagonists in shooters or sci-fi horror and we've seen how these game mechanics put limits on creativity so let's do away with the earth invasions space marines and alien parasites Take a risk with stories. Let's be positive about the future of space travel. Um, I'm really hoping for a dream daddy alien extraterrestrial. <laughs> for me, creating interesting life within the confines of what is physically possible is more ingenious and interesting than resorting to space magic or tired tropes. After we've sorted out the lack of diversity in our human characters, let's sort out the aliens, please. Thank you. <laughs>